When a developer makes a video game, it's oftentimes impossible for them to predict, or at least prepare for, every single permutation of what a player will do during any given moment. It's one thing for a developer to do something with the intention of pushing the player towards a certain action, but it's another thing to accidentally leave room to allow the player to do the opposite. That probably sounds a little confusing, so consider this instead. Think of any moment in any applicable game where control is briefly taken away from you during what would normally be a playable spot. Specifically, the camera. How many times have you played a game where the game itself momentarily steals control of the camera away from you to point it at something important or maybe just cool looking? Probably a few times, right? Now think of this. How many times have you played a game where you enter a new level, stage, area, or room where there's a giant, meticulously made centerpiece framed right in the middle of the shot, and it's virtually impossible to miss it? Again, probably a few times. Now think of this. How many times have you missed a cool moment or environmental design because the game didn't make it obvious enough or because you were still in control and just weren't pointing the camera in the right direction at the right time. Once again, probably a few times, and it sucks every time. It makes you feel like an inattentive idiot and like you have to restart the whole level because you clearly missed something that was intended to be seen. But that's why some games decide to either take control away from you temporarily or make certain assets impossible to miss so you couldn't miss them even if you wanted to. But what leads to this? When does a developer decide to take control away to deliberately point the camera at the big, cool thing you would likely miss otherwise? Or why does a developer stick a fancy, beautiful asset in the middle of the frame so that the only way to avoid it is if your television is turned off completely? This is usually where playtesting comes in. Developers take a group of people and watch them play a level as they would normally play it if they bought the game and played it at home. And usually, playtester habits reveal that, a lot of the time, players might completely miss the thing they were supposed to look at if it isn't made unavoidably obvious or if the game doesn't take control and forcefully point the camera at it. And the reason why the developers might want to emphasize this specific thing is either because it's important context to the story, or because it's something the art team put a lot of time and effort into, and they don't want players to accidentally ignore it. As someone who plays a lot of video games, I understand that this might get annoying. I don't enjoy having the pace of the game slow down or having control taken from me, but at the same time, I understand why it might be necessary. The unfortunate truth is that a lot of gamers are not as perceptive as developers want them to be, and they're especially not always as perceptive as they believe themselves to be. And that goes for me sometimes too. Even I occasionally miss stuff that was obvious in hindsight. I fully admit that. We're only human. But once in a while, a game manages to succeed in forcing the player to focus on the cool event without resorting to taking control away or super blatant framing. And they do it so well, the player probably doesn't even feel, notice, or mind it until the event is over, if at all. This is what brings me to Armored Core 6, the long-awaited return of From Software's long-running mecha franchise that had lied dormant for a decade since the release of Verdict Day in 2013. I reviewed the game, and although the weapon and general combat balance at the time needed a bit smoothing over, I still greatly enjoyed it and highly recommend it to anyone interested in fast-paced mecha mayhem. But the game relates to this specific topic because of one particular mission. A giant boss fight that's almost more like a puzzle or survival challenge than an actual back-and-forth battle. If you've played any of From's games in the last 10 years or so, then you're already familiar with this formula. The Dragon God in Demon Souls, Bed of Chaos in Dark Souls, Divine Dragon in Sekiro, all the way up to Rykard in Elden Ring. FromSoft is no stranger to gigantic set-piece bosses that are basically meant to be more like 
interactive action scenes than a true video game boss encounter. But the one in Armored Core 6 is something particularly special, and I've been thinking about it regularly ever since I played the game around launch. So I decided to make a video about why I think about it. The game has a fuck ton of cool moments, yes, but I want to zoom in on one particular fight in the game that does an expert job at manipulating you, the player, into looking at the exact spots it wants you to look at. And probably without you even noticing, or at least caring, that you're being manipulated. It's the final mission of Chapter 3, and it's aptly titled, Destroy the Ice Worm. This mission is a textbook example of how you can force a player to focus on the important and cool moments with just intuitive framing, without being intrusive, and with minimal risk of them missing it. Let's break things down one by one. When you first start the mission, one thing is extremely clear. The giant arena where the battle will take place is a flat, barren, frozen tundra with almost no distinguishable features besides some silhouettes of some structures far off into the distance. This might be considered a bad thing by people who want every aspect of a good fight to be flashy and spectacular, including the area the fight takes place in. But considering how this fight goes, it's best to prevent as much distracting visual noise as you possibly can. The player rushes forward with three NPC teammates, and the worm emerges directly in front of you, a short distance away, quickly closing the gap. Assuming you have the needle like you're supposed to, you go about the fight normally, hoping to land a shot in the ice worm's open and unprotected head. Once you do that, it loses part of its shielding, and Rusty begins to charge the cannon meant to temporarily disable the worm and make it vulnerable to attack. As the cannon gains power, an ominous distant glow behind the mountains in the horizon begins to brighten, an orange light contrasting the frigid, bluish-gray surroundings. It's pretty difficult to miss so long as you aren't wildly swinging your camera around. And once enough power is reached, Rusty fires, and a devastating blow shreds through the worm's body, causing it to fall over, now without its secondary shields. One thing the game does to hint that something big and awesome is about to happen is it brings down the volume of everything except dialogue and the sound of the cannon itself. So when you hear Rusty's badass line of, I won't miss, it's another thing that's almost impossible to not notice. It's practically a giant neon sign saying, hey, look at the worm if you aren't already doing so. This is the first big spectacle of the fight, and the brightness and power of the cannon fire can easily make the player look towards its source off in the horizon if they hadn't noticed it earlier. That distant glow I mentioned a minute ago. But even if, despite everything, you still missed any particular spectacle of the fight, the game still has your back. It's not just one and done. You still have to shoot the worm in the mouth and repeat the process two more times, which means two more opportunities to see it get absolutely shredded. By now, you've likely already noticed that the game's heads-up display already points you in the right direction of where the ice worm is going to pop up from the ground thanks to the big red arrow and associated sound effect. But one thing I noticed is that after you hit the worm in the head with the needle and it's ready to get smacked by the cannon, the game seems to control the worm to try and have it pop up directly in front of you. It doesn't seem to do that during regular combat, but when Rusty is charging up the cannon, you might instinctively swing the camera around to catch the worm, but you don't actually need to. All you have to do is point the camera towards the more spacious part of the huge arena, and it should come up in that spot automatically. But Phase 1 isn't the only part with its fair share of spectacle. Phase 2 has an interesting little part where the worm retreats to a greater distance away and launches a swath of drones, which are mostly taken care of by your allies. It's honestly kinda unlikely you'll need to worry about them yourself, but seeing them close in with the worm not far behind is pretty neat. After a repeat of what you did in the first phase though, the second phase is over and the worm is down to about a third of its health left, and the third phase begins but it begins with yet another cool spectacle. If you stay locked onto the worm, 
and you should, then you'll see it pick its head up and the game adopts a more cinematic angle to show it unleash a huge explosion of coral. Not only does it look sick as hell, but it's also a taste of something to come later. It's another wow moment that's pretty much impossible to miss. Finally, throughout the third phase, the worm adopts a whole set of new attacks, plus it sports a coral buff. It's harder to hit this time around because of its more complicated movements, but it's still doable. So after hitting it with the needle twice, Rusty disables the limiter on the cannon and charges it past 100%. And if you know where the cannon is located, and hopefully you do by this point, you can glance over at the horizon to see it shine brighter than it did with the previous two shots, and with more volatility. Once Rusty fires the cannon, it's time for one more onslaught of everything you can throw at it. When the worm's health is depleted, the final firework show begins, and this is the only time in the mission where the game finally takes control away to lock the camera onto the worm, which explodes in a fiery display. The game is so focused on this finale that it even hides the heads-up display, and even zooms the camera out an extra bit so none of your own Armored Core's parts obscure the view. The Ice Worm is probably From Software's coolest cinematic boss ever, and without sacrificing the usual interactivity you've experienced from usual fights. I have a hard time deciding if I like it more than Rikard from Elden Ring, but either way, this fight is a masterful show of how to do a heavily cinematic encounter without needing to take control away from the player during the actual action. The game simply uses repetition, good framing, clear hints, and a lack of distractions to ensure you're hopefully always looking at the right place at the right time. It's a fucking awesome battle, and arguably the coolest sequence in the game, especially considering it's a team effort that involves some NPCs you've been interacting with all the way up to this point. Of course, not every moment in every game that wants you to focus on something will be able to do it so smoothly and unintrusively, because they're not always going to be boss fights specifically. But it just goes to show that no matter the situation, if a developer truly wants you to put your eyes on something, they will find a way to get you to do it, whether you're conscious of it or not. This concludes my analysis of Armored Core 6's Ice Worm fight and games making you look at things. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.